Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Today, we would like to talk about life under one of the world's most secretive regimes, North Korea. While the country often makes headlines around the world, whether it's about its nuclear tests, endless provocations, or the peculiarities of the Kim regime, little is known of the situation on the ground. What our guest, Professor Andre l a n k o v calls the real North Korea. Professor l a n k o v is a Russian scholar specialized in Korean studies. He graduated from Leningrad State University, but also attended Kim Il-sung University in Pyongyang from 1984 to 1985. Since 2004, he is professor at Kukmin University in Seoul. Professor l a n k o v is the author of various books on North Korean history and politics, the most recent of which, The Real North Korea, Life and Politics in the Failed Stalinist Utopia, was published in 2013. As one of the world's foremost scholars on North Korea, he also contributes to various media outlets. Professor l a n k o v welcome to Korea and the World. Thank you. Why did you specialize in Korea? Well, uh, pretty much every single Korea specialist unless he or she is an ethnic Korean, is likely to give the same answer to this question. You know, it was purely by incident. Uh, because what actually happened, at high school I wanted, actually earlier, I always wanted to be a historian, essentially from the primary school. And in the high school I was much interested in China. It was the 1970s, uh, Sino-Soviet split, a lot of publications, highly critical, but rather perceptive about China, so I was much interested. And, and I finally, uh, I entered the Chinese department, the department of the Chinese history at the Leningrad State University. I was very proud of myself because it was a highly competitive place, and very soon I discovered that I was going to become unemployed. Because... Um, The, uh, every year, uh, the department uh, produced five to seven students for roughly two or three jobs. Mm. And we all were very good students. I'm not sure about myself, us as well. Uh, so, and so when I was approached by the dean, or actually head of the department, uh, to change my major uh, from Chinese studies to Korean studies, on the assumption that first I will go using a large, almost never used exchange quarters to North Korea, and then uh, become a teacher uh, and a professor uh, at the university. Of course, I said yes. And uh, so, well, and the rest is history, at least my personal history. So you have spent some time at Kim Il-sung University? Uh, yes, for, yeah, 84, 85. And so oh, how yeah. did that time change your image of the country? Do you think it differs from that of analysts and pundits who never spent any time uh, in North Korea? Well, in one regard, I, uh, one of the first shocks, because contrary to what most people perceive, believe, in the Soviet Union, North Korea had a very bad reputation. So, uh, back before that, I got access, not security clearance is a bit too serious to say, but some permit to read a closed, sec- a kind of a semi-classified, not really classified, Soviet anal- analysis of North Korea. Before I went, I applied, and as a student, as still an undergraduate, I was issued, it was not that difficult, and I spent few months reading the stuff which was secretly and officially officially it was you know smile well officially well officially soviet media did not write about north korea but unofficially there were classified publications and semi-classified publications for the uh, written for the specialists only and uh, some people who were basically political elite could easily get access and they painted a very black picture of a crazy Stalinist dictatorship, a highly unreliable a lie who is cheating always, cheating on us, on Russia, who are wasting money in all possible ways, who are killing their own people in large numbers. Very bleak picture. So what did you see when you were there? It was a normal country. Uh, my first shock. And now when I read all the stories about North Korea by North Korean sympathizers or kind of semi-sympathizers, it's my imp- impression. You expect... to descend into hell. And you suddenly see a pretty normal picture. You see a good, uh, well, you discover that yes, it's not always raining in North Korea. And as a matter of fact, they have blue, clear blue skies. 
and the uh, North Korean women are among the world's most beautiful and mm. do North Korean kids smile they do smile and there are no people dead bodies hanging on every single lamppost on the streets and there are there's a lot of soldiers but their face don't tell you that they are going to shoot you at spot uh, so the first impression was very good and they thought wow something might have been wrong with all this story it might have been propaganda so impression was quite good then in due time in few months time when I developed some contacts to an extent I could because it was very controlled I began to see that yes it was not exactly propaganda it was true uh, but uh, something people forgot politics is a rather small part of the average man or woman's life you don't spend all your time thinking about next, say, if you are, say, American citizens. I think, how often do you think about this tall black man who is now living in the White House? Or all these firebrands who recently got majority in the Congress? How often on your, on your average day? Once, twice? Yeah, probably From, not that often. No. Yes, absolutely. And uh, North Koreans are no different. Because the system is very kind of ideological, very controllable. People have to think about it far more frequently than the average American does. But it doesn't mean that it consist, consist, uh, this is a kind of the major content of their lives. They spend nothing thinking about how to die for the dear leader or how to overthrow this bloody dictator. No, most of them don't give a damn. They have just normal lives. And politics is always marginal, unless you are you know, on the front line or in a concentration camp, politics doesn't play that much role in your life, even though it probably uh, uh, d determines the environment where you operate. Your book, The Real North Korea, is not only an account of the situation in the country, but it seems also to be a critique of international media reporting yes. on North Korea. Uh, to a very large extent, yes. You, you mentioned how the media predict, for example, major famines on a regular basis, mm -hmm. but they never come to pass. So. Where does the image of North Korea as the media draws it differ from what you perceived uh, uh, in your uh, book? Well, uh, because the problem is with the media, they have to be simplistic. And it's very good when you sit in an, an academic ivory tower to criticize the journalists for being simplistic. But first, they cannot know everything and they have to digest a simple message for their readers because their readers have no time to spend hours and hours learning more about North Korea when they have some more urgent business to do. So they have to simplify. But, I, and this is understandable, unfortunately, their simplifications are to a very large extent driven by the ideological assumptions and fantasies and cliché and stereotypes, which have nothing to do with North Korea. First, I, I already mentioned one of the ideas that, you know, the idea that North Korea is a place where, you know, sun never shines. It does. Then uh, you have, um, well, let's uh, say in such a way. Uh, there are essentially two types of stereotypes, two groups of stereotypes, which I would probably call left-leaning and right-leaning. Left and right. The Western media almost exclusively dominated by the right discourse, which I don't like. Uh, in South Korean media and Russian media, you see a lot of the left discourse, which I dislike even more. Uh, but because we are talking in English, or presumably for English audience, I will just mention, I will just probably talk about uh, how it's presented in the Western kind of slightly conservative or neutralist media. So right. the idea is uh, that North Korea is a dictatorship, right? But it's always presented as if, first, North Korea, nothing but uh, political repression happens in North Korea, and it's not the case. You know, uh, the average North Korean lives in fear, it's true. Hmm. But, well, it's a bit like living in, in a mountain village, where you have to negotiate your way to your fields and back through very slippery, dangerous slope, and people occasionally get killed. Uh, so they basically understand that if they do certain type of things, like talking about certain issues or be behaving themselves, behaving in certain ways, they create a political threat. They do. It's possible they can be arrested, they can be tortured, they can be sent in prison camps. They know it. So they are careful. But most of their life, well, they just have a normal life. And media is simply missing this life. 
Second, they have the stereotype of a Stalinist state, which is seriously misleading, because North Korea is not a Stalinist state. It used to be a perfect Stalinist state maybe 30 years ago. It's not the case anymore. Uh, they have a booming private economy. Uh, the government, judging by the recent indication, Kim Jong-un government has decided to start Chinese-style reforms, and they are beginning to reform themselves from above. And once again, at the same time, they have a dramatic transformation from below. So it's now going both ways. Unlike China, it was only from above. Uh, so economy is to a very large extent private. You have North Korean capitalists and so on. And this is funny, when foreign journalists come to Pyongyang and they see these expensive restaurants and these well-dressed people in these restaurants and modern cars, they always say, oh, it must be corrupt officials, who else? Because you have this idea of Stalinist state, which is very corrupt, which is not true. Most Stalinist states were not corrupt in a normal sense, because corruption doesn't make sense in a Stalinist state. Money has no power. Power has power. Right, yeah. So you have to climb the, lad uh, the official ladder to become rich and successful, and money don't help much. So they assume that it's a corrupt Stalinist state, and therefore these people who are enjoying nice Japanese sushi in Pyongyang, uh, they must be corrupt officials. Well, some of them are, exactly because North Korea is not a corrupt, uh, is not a Stalinist state anymore, it's quite corrupt. But most of them are just new entrepreneurs. They, if, if they, it's not different from a crowd you would see in some expensive French restaurant in Manhattan. Uh, people who are making money by selling, buying stuff, producing stuff, well, everything. Uh, so, we will speak about social economic uh, changes a bit yes, later, but yeah. I'd, I'd like to just focus on the media for now. Um, the access to information about North Korea is very restricted in the mm -hmm. South, especially online. So how does this, in your opinion, influence the image that South Koreans have of their neighbor? Almost no influence. Almost no influence? Yeah. Because of two reasons. We should not overestimate the level of restrictions. Because I read uh, not on Sin Moon, well, I should read it every morning, but it's so boring and repetitive. So I usually rely of, on one of my postgraduates who does it for his research and uh, brief me on the new public of what what's new and unusual in this boring newspaper every morning. Uh, but I do it, and not because I have some special uh, permit, permit to do so issued by the Blue House. There are many ways to get around these restrictions, purely technical, you know, proxy service. Well, I'm pretty sure every, North Korean, every South Korean teenager with any interest in technology does know how to get around. And sometimes I believe that these regulations, which are very bad, non-democratic, anachronistic, I'm talking about the state security law, uh, but uh, having said that, it's not very efficient. Problem is that South Koreans, younger generations, don't care about North Korea anymore that Americans care about some poor English-speaking country like, say, Sri Lanka or Jamaica. Mm. Uh, so for the average South Korea now, North Korea is a strange, bizarre place whose population, by some twist of history, speaks the same language, and whose population, the South Koreans are told, but don't completely believe anymore, are part of the same nation, and a place from where occasionally some minor problems can come. Uh, but the interest is very, very low. And this is understandable. 70 years of division has brought a gradual, very slow, it didn't happen overnight, it took generations, but it, it do, it's happening, slow collapse of contact and perception. Because you know there is a famous definition of a nation as an imagined community by Anderson. Uh, because the national consciousness, the national identity is made by shared history or perceived shared history. And the history of North and South Korea of, since 1950, roughly, have been as different as it gets. Therefore, uh, South Koreans are not interested. So you write in your book that the regime might have an interest in being perceived as, as mm -hmm. irrational and unpredictable. Mm -hmm. So is this 
popular media image of North Korea serving the, the regime's interest in the Absolutely. Area. Because once again, we were slightly distracted from talks about the media perception. I said one of Mr. Obsessions, the idea of the Stalinist state, the idea of place where everything is repression, and another idea is the irrational state. It's a perfectly rational state. They are masters of survival. What they do is, with very few exceptions, is extremely well-planned and usually not always well-executed actions which clear political goal in mind. They are brilliant politicians who survived, who have survived against all odds. It might be not a good idea, not a good news for their, for their subjects, but well, where on the world can you see an elite which would be willing to surrender its power? I don't think it's physically possible. And in North Korea, this elite, in order to stay in power, basically has no choice but to, well, do what they're doing, uh, creating a lot of suffering for their own people. It's true. Let's not have idealized picture. But from their point of view, these people are remarkably rational because they have survived when nearly all other communist state collapsed. They survived over a ruined economy, they survived against, without no allies, they survived against powerful enemies. So for them it's a success. And they, uh, they are proud, partially because it means they still can enjoy their cognac and caviar, but I think to themselves, because people always, always lie, lie to themselves. They never say, uh, they always want to see themselves in some kind of good light. So I'm pretty sure they say uh, something like, we have saved the North Korean nationhood or statehood, yes, some farmers died in the process, but it was a heroic death for the future of our actually pure North Korean nation, which is so superior to the traitors, South Koreans who even married to foreigners, who have polluted their uh, pure blood, who are listening to these disgusting American songs, and at the end of the day should not even be seen as Koreans, or some, they obviously belong to some inferior brand of Koreans, and our wisdom, our bright, brilliant policy has saved the hope of humankind, or at least our glorious nation with 5,000 or God knows 15,000, 25,000, right? As many zeros as you like. History. Well, I would prefer to be more cynical. I say a hereditary elite have managed to come uh, to create, uh, to save, to stay in power and still enjoy very modest luxury. As a matter of fact, it's a modest luxury. Don't believe this report that, that North Koreans uh, rich are behaving like oil shakes from the Middle East. No, they don't. Well, well, this is what they have achieved. They're brilliant people. Brutal, yes, well. But at the same time, it's a choice between fu your future of your children and your friends and future of some farmers from distant provinces you have never seen. Let's talk a bit about how North Korea is really. How is it for the people who are living there? Um, how oppressing is the presence of the regime in daily life? How overarching is the party in the layman's mm, life? Well, uh, in one regard, there are, there are large areas which are completely off limits. Basically, if you are a North Korean, one of the basic things you learn in the, basically in the kindergarten, you should not talk politics unless you are just repeating what is written in the most recent issue of the official newspaper, preferably today's issue. Because official line changes, but even the fact it changes, it's never admitted. Read Orwell, 1984, he perceived very correctly this peculiarity of the uh, repressive regimes. So, anyway, so the first uh, rule is don't talk politics. And, of course, don't challenge the government. Even if you entertain some secret thoughts, you don't talk it to anybody but very trusted people. I know some cases when families dis d escaped overseas and only then uh, basically shared some kind of highly critical thoughts. Uh, they have entertained the thoughts for many years, but they did not trust one another. Enough to share it. Uh, so basically you don't think about it. You don't articulate any political discontent. And as a matter of fact, it does help. Because people, when people cannot share their ideas, it means that these ideas have less chances to grow. And it helps to stay in, con to in, con in control. And you know that if you break the rule, you pay the price. And you also know that until recently, until the family responsibility principle was gradually phased out by Kim Jong-il in the 1990s, 
Kim Jong Il was a closet liberal, as a matter of fact. People don't quite realize it, but he was. He he significantly liberalized the political system. In uh, what sense? Uh, in mm-hmm. one sense, one of the things he he cancelled the family responsibility principle. Uh, before that, if somebody committed a political crime, uh, this person, of course, would go to prison or would be killed. But all people who shared a house, his or her is almost 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 always male, his household registration, would go to prison as well. So many, if not most, political prisoners in the North Korean prisons under Kim Il Sung until the mid 1990s, if not later, were family members. And Kim Jong-il essentially discontinued this practice in few few stages. As a change under Kim Jong-il, he essentially, well, uh, escaped to China, attempted escape to China, was a serious crime for decades. Any overseas country, especially China. No, not especially, most of people simply went to China. Uh, and under Kim Jong-il, it was became just a, ma- a minor offense, uh, light offense, punishable with usually a few months of imprisonment. Uh, so unless uh, North Korean refugees in China talk to the missionaries, read Bibles, and do other outrageous uh, activities, um, they usually treat it very lightly. Uh, so it was another thing, so talking about Kim Jong-il. So people basically understand that they should not do it, and if somebody in their family does it, it's also a problem. And of course, there is always a great sense of tension. Once you start getting rich, if it goes above the level of, say, a small countryside, a small, say, uh, market stall in a countryside town, you immediately discover that you are again facing serious risks. Nonetheless, nonetheless... So you explain in your book something that I think not many people know about North Korea, is that the society is divided into three categories or mm-hmm. castes, yes, so yes, based yeah, on their yeah, family history yeah, during yeah, the Korean yes. War. Can you maybe explain uh, how yeah. that works? Actually, it's, there are five groups, but five. Two, mm-hmm. two are small. So for, to simplify, because don't go into excessive mm-hmm. details, I usually say three, actually five, but two uh, groups are very small and can be um, sort of neglected for the practical reasons. Uh, so we have three groups. Yes, the idea is basically your position, your chances of promotion, your place where you can leave everything depends on your Songbun origin and your origin family background is determined by what your ancestors direct lay a line male ancestors did roughly speaking between the 1930s and the early 1950s so it depended how your say great-grandfather behaved around 1945 this determines your entire treatment how you are treated by the government is there any way to get out of the caste system? Uh, no, through some, no, 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 it's forever. No, no, forever. It's forever. If you do some uh, something exceptionally heroic, probably it will help. But um, as far as I understand, the idea that somebody can be reclassified is very unusual. So, say, uh, just to be more precise, if your uh, great grandfather, whoever your ancestor who was alive and active in the forties, was working in the Japanese administration at any Theoretically, any capability. Practically, if he was doing some work like, say, technical, uh, non-administrative work, it could be okay. But if he was, say, even a minor clerk in the colonial office, in some office of the colonial administration, if he was a landowner whose lands were confiscated in 1945, 1946, I'm sorry, March 1946, if he was a religious activist of any kind, even though Kim Il-sung's family was a family of religious activists, and so on, you would uh, suffer, you would be part of the hostile class, which means no right to live in Pyongyang and other major cities, no right to enter most colleges, or if your origin is especially bad, any college, most likely doing uh, unskilled or semi-skilled manual work in the countryside. Korea Times column that the majority still love Kim Il-sung. Yes, Kim Il-sung is good. Yeah. I think Kim Il-sung is good. He, he, Kim Il-sung was a mass killer, who person who created the greatest suffering for the Koreans, but he's going to remain popular forever. I repeat, forever. Uh, even Why after, so? Oh, long story. If you're interested, <laughs> we can talk. Uh, well, uh, because he's likely to become kind of symbol of the North Korea in case of unification. He is likely to become a symbol, being the founding father of the state, he is likely to become a symbol of, for many Koreans uh, who are going to be disappointed, uh, dissatisfied with the post-unification developments. 
and there will be a lot of such people. And then he will become, and I don't even expect more kind of the mainstream uh, to attack him too violently because, well, he is a good kind of symbol. And if you look at the founding fathers of many states, most of them were rather unpleasant people. Because, you know, nice people don't succeed in such dirty business, which requires willpower, concentration, but also ambition and cruelty. Having said that, uh, it was not, I believe, your major question. I believe you, you uh, t- talking about the uh, North Korean attitude to the authority. Right. Well, of course, they believe propaganda to a very large extent because people always believe propaganda, usually at least most time, or most of the time. And they are, have been told about the greatness of the ruling family. And most people buy the story. Even they might have some other thoughts about, say, a particular member thinking like, you know, Kim Il-sung was great. He was a great man. Has he only been alive, things would be so mm. wonderful. Of course, it will have the same or worse mess. But, so you uh, have a negative image then of Kim Jong-il uh, Kim Il-sung Kim, compared yes, to, uh, to the... Yes, yes, yes. That they are not uh, good in, uh, not as good as their you know, father or grandfather. It's quite possible. Um, and then there is a belief, uh, they don't believe that South Korea is poor, it's the, it's gone, but they believe that South Korea is under the American occupation, and they have a great deal of national pride about themselves, and they are looking for ways to justify it, and the propaganda, official propaganda is helping, telling them essentially that you are culturally and racially even pure, purer than anybody else, and nationalist message is, you know, sending extremely well. You can see it easily in South Korea, and for that matter in all East Asian countries, which are places of crazy nationalism, very reminiscent of Europe before the First World War, and even by these standards, uh, high standards, uh, North Korea is exceptional. Uh, So basically, you know, this mixture makes people quite uh, committed to the state in many cases. But what I would like to emphasize. There are very good books by Alexei Yurchak about the late Soviet Union. And in these books, he emphasizes something very important, that the average uh, Soviet citizen was not against system and was not pro-system. Active opposition, active supporters were two tiny minorities. And he was not even strictly speaking between, because he lived a sort of normal life, occasionally switching to the official mood, emulating, making essentially a performance, doing what it was expected by the system, not because he believed all the words he was supposed to deliver, but because it was a part of a ritual necessary to maintain the state and the order, and it was accepted as necessary. I think it's a fairly good description of North Korea as well. Most of the people they know, they go to their their markets, they buy stuff, they sell stuff, uh, they work in the workshops, they make some kind of crude uh, consumption goods, uh, they probably go to some factories, the factories are functioning, maybe they work hard to design a better nuclear device or something, and in the rest of the time they don't care much about politics, uh, and there is a great deal of support, but the problem is that support is eroding, because what is killing the support? Knowledge about China, knowledge about uh, South Korea, which is getting in. Very quickly, did South Korean dramas play a role in... Huge, uh, yeah, huge. They're getting smuggled in? Uh, yes, huge. It's maybe of the leading factors, if not the leading factor. Uh, because they're popular, they're interesting, it makes sense, financial sense, to make copies. And it's not incidental that Kim Jong-un government understands that this is dangerous and that he is very serious in getting rid of this they do what they can to stop smuggling, to punish people who watch, especially who produce and smuggle the dramas. Over last year, it has become significantly more risky to watch it, and people begin to, because people are trained to be very obedient in North Korea. Having said that, the same situation, this high repressive repressions, this means people are terrified, and they don't try not to watch it anymore, but the impact, the damage has been made. Uh, so a lot of people, maybe majority, almost definitely majority of the population have seen the dramas, and even the official North Korean propaganda doesn't say that South Korea is poor anymore, it's gone. So officially, North Korea is a socialist state, a socialist economy, but what about in practice? What is the de facto well, economic system of It's North not Korea? socialist, of course, it's not socialist. If you define socialism as a system where the state owns and manages most or a very large part of the industrial assets, 
No, Skadi is not a such country. Because But it's not a market economy, right? So it's sort of market economy. Yes? It's a de facto market economy. Because what's actually happened in the early 1990s, uh, the old, not even socialist, there was a hyper Stalinist socialist system collapsed. Because it was very inefficient and to a very large extent dependent on the supply of subsidized fuel, spare parts, and some crucial goods from the Soviet Union and other communist countries. Heavily subsidized supply. They had no money to pay. So everything collapsed. And massive famine, which killed about half a million people or a bit more, not two or three million as it's often claimed, but about half a million, which is still a lot for such a small country. After the famine, people began to essentially, during the famine actually, began to rediscover capitalism. Uh, people began to sell stuff, buy stuff, sell everything which was sellable, because government didn't give them anything, rations were not issued, uh, state shops were empty. So people began to, first, you know, farmers began to work in illegal fields, people began to steal everything which could be stolen from their factories for the sale, they did some... Sell to sm- China? At the end of the day, always China, but it doesn't mean that they were directly selling. He was selling to somebody who was selling to somebody who was eventually selling right. to China. Uh, well, you know. And the result was quite remarkable. The result was a huge transformation. Which, which is over by now. We don't know exact figures how much of the North Korean GDP is produced by the private sector. There are estimates, but highly unreliable. But we have some better delay idea of how much income for the average family generated by the private economic activities. It looks like, say, roughly three quarters. So to a very large extent, the government is economically irrelevant. It's a kind of de facto market economy, but until recently, the government didn't want to encourage it, and they wanted to do what they could to prevent the, this economic developments, disintegration of socialism, to slow it down, assuming that it's bad for the political stability, and they're probably right. So Kim Jong Il's logic was: if the, he goes way of China, he ends up not like China, but like East Germany. Because South Korea is across the border, South Korea is very attractive. So if he loses control, if he becomes too soft on people, people will demand unification like East Germans did on the assumption that they will give them, well, in case of East Germany, they were dreaming uh, not Trabant, but uh, Mercedes-Benz. In North Korea, well, they're dreaming not a rusty bike, but Hyundai Sonata. But because such fear, which I believe to be completely founded. It's not paranoid. He was right. Uh, He decided not to take the risks and keep the situation under control, but he could not revive the old economy. It didn't work. Uh, So um, there was a kind of, you know, uh, tacit acceptance of marketization, which was happening anyway. They were not happy about it once again, but it was happening. So what could they do? They were just accepting it. It was Kim Jong-un's policy. The policy has changed many times. Uh, to say that they were cracking on markets, yes, between 2005 and 2009. They were encouraging the markets in, uh, say, 2000 to 2004, and they were tacitly tolerating the markets in the 1990s and again after 2009. Uh, so they had wild changes of the policy over the period. Since then, for almost five years by now, they almost exactly five years by now, the markets were, have been left alone. They didn't do anything, and even very modest measures which would damage the market activities were not taking. And again, over the last maybe two years, they began to encourage market activities. And they began to encourage something which I should mention before I didn't. Uh, that is gradual takeover of the state industries from within by the private capital. Because many of the enterprises which are officially registered as state enterprises are actually privately owned and privately operated. Like you come to Pyongyang, you see a restaurant, you go to a restaurant and you say, must be a state enterprise. No, it's not. And you see it from the quality of food and service, which is much better than you would expect in a normal state, right? Italy, which is awful always. Mm. Uh, but uh, it's privately owned. So somebody has money, 
he or very frequently she, there is a great deal of women in the private business in North Korea, makes a deal with the local administration, she registers, she opens a restaurant, she, she registers this restaurant as a state property. Officially, she is just a state appointed manager, but actually she is an owner, she invests her money, she hires people, she fires people, she pays salary, a lot of things is happening. So yes, women seem to have a very important role yes, to play in the North Korean extremely. economy. Can you maybe explain how did that come to pass? Um, what is then the role of, of the men if the women seem to control more and more? Funny, yeah. Uh, funny thing is that the old uh, North Korean system was pretty much patriarchic. And it did help women at the end of the day, surprisingly. Why? When things began to c- collapse and fall apart in the early 1990s, the government still demanded that all males should go to work in the state factories. The state factories, most of them, came to a, complete, a near complete standstill. There was no job, nothing to do. So these people went there, they were just sitting there doing nothing. But... Why were they still going there if there was no work? A way to control them. Right. The government wanted to know what the hell they are doing. But for women, once a woman was officially registered as a housewife and every married woman could register as a housewife and every single North Korean woman did marry in her mid or late 20s. It was an absolute must. So... These women who register themselves, they could go to the market and they do what they could. As a result, as a result, uh, among the medium and low level businesses, the women are grossly overrepresented. Grossly overrepresented. Big business is different because in order to run a really big business, if you want to have, say, a small factory or seafood fishing, it's a place where big money are made, seafood and fishing activities. Uh, if you want to run such a place, such a business, you have to have good connections. It means usually you have to be male. So if we speak of economic growth in North, North Korea, in this situation of relative affluence, so to speak, in Pyongyang, is that really... Not only Pyongyang. Mm-hmm. Right. Is that really good news from the perspective of regime survival? Mm, yes and no. We don't know. Uh, it's a very complicated because issue. Because you explain in your book that people usually do not start revolutions when they're Absolutely. desperate, right? Yeah. It's, it's complicated. Why? On one hand, it's a usual misconception that if they have good food, they will not revolt. Problem is, if they have food, they have time. And because food is not coming from the state anymore, they, will, they are less dependent on the state. So I can easily imagine how these people are beginning to talk. As a matter of fact, I know they are beginning to talk. But... It's on one hand. On the other hand, on the other hand, the new business elite, the new bourgeoisie, if you like, the owners of these businesses, they are not a revolutionary force, I believe. They might become, uh, but if you are a reasonably successful business person, I wouldn't say businessman because many of them are women right now, your success depends on the continuous existence of a separate North Korean state. If you say a woman in, say, early 40s, running a few small shops, a couple of workshops where teenage girls are making cheap imitation of the Chinese goods, and maybe some, on top of that, a couple of restaurants to diversify. If you are sufficiently smart, ruthless, hardworking, manipulative, brutal, greedy, ambitious, and creative, you will eventually become, say, a CEO of North Korea's second largest supermarket chain. Right. And as long as Imat, Lotte Mart, and other South Korean supermarket chains are not allowed to get in. If they get in, your business is ruined. Your life too. You have to be lucky. You have to consider yourself lucky if you keep the few shops you have now. Probably you will not. Question is whether the North Korean bourgeoisie understand that they need protection of the party apparatchiks because they despise one another. The party elite still tends to see uh, the new businessmen as con men, as parasites, as somebody who is now whose existence is only possible because the system is not perfect yet. And the new business elite tends to see the party elite as parasite who right. do nothing but demand jo- uh, bribes for doing nothing. And this mutual, well, no love is lost, I would say. However, having said that, uh, in the long run, these both groups need one another and they might start to understand that they don't need a revolution. They don't need a unification. They don't need unification. 
So they probably can become a force for stability, or at least be unusually passive, politically passive. I mean the North Korean bourgeoisie. We don't know yet. Oh, only time will tell. But personally, if you ask my uh, kind of guess, I would say if North Korea follows the same way of marketization from below, maybe combined with reforms from above, which are beginning to start, economic reforms, no political reforms, God forbid, no. Uh, well, I would probably estimate, well, I would probably bet uh, that the uh, survival chances are maybe one to three, one to four. One to four. Yeah. More like, most likely this it, uh, will end up in a violent revolution, great mass, which will be followed either by the South Korean takeover or by the Chinese intervention and emergence of a pro-Chinese puppet state. But for the meantime, it seems that the Korean regime, on the one hand side, has this marketization going on that they decided not to stop. But on the they other hand, cannot stop. They, so they tried. Cannot stop. They tried to stop. But on the other hand, in, in your book, you say that any kind of regime reform would be, quote, political suicide. So why are Chinese style market reforms impossible? Well, South Korea exists. North Korea right. is a divided nation. This is a major problem. Uh, South Korea, well, if you look at the per capita income gap between South and North Korea, well, it depends whom you believe. If you believe the optimists, it's roughly 1 to 14. If you believe the pessimists, it's 1 to 30 or 1 to 40. Even if it's merely 1 to 14, that is the most conservative estimate. It still means that this is the world's largest gap uh, between two countries which share a land border. Second largest will be, as far as I understand, Yemen and Oman. And the third largest is uh, Haiti and Dominican Republic. And in this case, they share language. And in both countries, the official line, people don't necessarily always buy, but still the official line in both South and North is that they are part, divided parts of the same nation. It creates a very unpleasant situation, from, if seen, if look at the situation from, you know, the headquarters of the Korean Workers' Party. Because if North Korean people become more aware of South Korean prosperity and less afraid of the government and more capable of organizing themselves, there are very high chances they will challenge the government in order to get unification. On the assumption that unification will immediately deliver them the lifestyle they see in the South Korean TV dramas. It's not going to happen even though unification is likely to bring them a dramatic improvement in the material life, combined with serious uh, psychological shock, because they will become the second-rate citizen and will remain for the rest of their life second-rate citizens in a unified country. However, having said that, North Korean government understands the risk. Such risks don't exist in China because of two reasons. Uh, first, there is no South China. Right. Taiwan does exist, but it's a tiny island state. And so China and China, Chinese are aware about, say, the American success, the Japanese success, the South Korean success. So what? It's a success of a different countries, not another part of the same nation. And also, China cannot become the 51st states, state of the United States of America. <laughs> it cannot become a Japanese prefecture. There is no place they can unify uh, on the assumption that such a huge and very rich country will immediately make them all rich too. As a matter of fact, if we look at the recent developments in Ukraine, one of the reasons, apart from nationalism and great disgust about the last 25 years of the Ukrainian history in Crimea and to somewhat less extent in eastern Ukraine, was just very high living standards in Russia and very low living standards in Ukraine, which is the only country, post-Soviet country, where the actual per capita income went down since the time of the Soviet collapse. So, same situation, you know. Uh, it was just another reminder how powerful this dream of becoming a part of more prosperous community, if this community happens to speak the same language and seemingly ready to embrace you as, you know, part of the same you know, nation, how powerful such dreams, whether they are founded or not, is another matter, can be politically. And this is the reason why Kim Jong-il didn't want reforms. Kim Jong-il is starting reforms. Why? There is one problem. Kim Jong-il was old. He saw that the system was gradually falling apart. But he understood perfectly well that if he just sits on top of the system, 
he will probably the system will probably last long enough for him to be outlived by the system. All right. And as we see, he succeeded because his strategic goal was, as I used to say in his, when he was alive, his strategic goal was to die a natural death in his palace. It's exactly what happened. He's another winner. But his son is different. His son is young, and there is almost no chances that the system, the slow disintegration of the system, which is happening, it will bring it down uh, sooner or later, and there are almost no chances that it will happen well, 50 years down the track. It's, will, it's going to happen much earlier. And he needs 40 years, or preferably to die 50 years, to die to natural death. So from his point of view, it makes sense to take the initiative. He knows that the system is falling apart and is going to collapse when he will be in his maybe 40s or maybe even 30s. So, what and, kind of reforms could he try to enact? Uh, Are we talking more on the economic side or some uh, kind of... Only economic. Don't touch politics. <laughs> Don't right. touch politics. Brainwash the people. Tell them all this old rubbish. Tell them you rubbish. Do it with the greatest intensity because otherwise they will start rebellion and probably will feel sorry about it eventually, but it's another matter. Uh, so what he's doing, uh, you, say, you ask what he could do. Actually, he's doing it now. He began to do it two years ago. And first step was very smart and expected, agriculture. Mm -hmm. What he did, it was an agricultural reform. And they began to gradually switch step by step towards uh, private agriculture. Uh, they began to divide, initially they allocated some parts of the state fields, on paper it's cooperative farms, but it's a fiction, it's a state farm essentially. They allocated some fields of the cooperative farms uh, to particular families. And they allowed families to register as a production team. So on paper it's not a family, it's just a production team. Everything is very socialist, very socialist. Right. But it's actually a family who work on the same field and they were given 30% of the harvest. And as a result, last year, 2013, they had the best harvest in decades. And to, talking about media, nobody paid attention. We mm. got these fi fake reports about coming starvation, which are often planted by the North Korean government itself, as a matter of fact, used to be not anymore. They don't do it anymore. Why they would they do, do that? Because they need food to eat. Right. And the more noise they make, the better. They learned it a long time ago. Uh, so there is a kind of unholy alliance of the aid groups anti-Kim activists and the North Korean government, who are all interested in planting and spreading the stories about coming famine. Uh, so, but it's not the case anymore, but it used to be the case for many years. And the media which was writing about coming famine, uh, coming starvation, they did not pay any attention that North Korea last year had the best harvest since maybe the late 1980s. Uh, and the first time they produced enough food to feed themselves. Why? Because workers were not working for the party leader and state, but they were for working for themselves. Very simple. Uh, it's what they are doing. And the recent reports, very recent, we got these documents recently, technically classified, but they have been leaked, uh, that from the next year they will increase the share, which go to the families from 30% to 60%. Hmm. And uh, they also allocate large private plots, which was a complete anathema in the past. So this is what's happening. And in industries, uh, they also intro are introducing second step, what's happening in industries, they are introducing a new reform, give managers of the state enterprises a great managerial freedom to find resources, to buy stuff, to sell stuff, everything. Bes essentially, he... It's always, almost always male in this case because we are talking state industries and this is big old boys club. Uh, so uh, he is becoming indistinguishable from the private entrepreneur in many regards. Only duty is to make some obligatory fixed uh, contribution, actually a chain of contributions with different names to the state budget and uh, not much different from corporate tax. And actually in terms right. of mm -hmm. share of income also not much different from corporate tax a Western businessman would have to pay. And so this is beginning to, this is uh, being uh, basically announced quietly in a classified document which had wide circulation uh, in May this year and likely to be implemented from the next year. So I would expect, yes, and as a matter of fact, this year, in spite of drought, we are going to have a good harvest. 
And next year, they are going to have probably a serious economic growth. Maybe it will take a couple of years before the country will start taking off. But these reforms, I, I, I have a bad news, capitalism works. Well, there are maybe more important things than economic growth, I know. Don't count me as a crazy supporter of capitalism. But uh, when it comes to economic growth and economic efficiency, it does work very, very well. Maybe it's a sad news, but it's it's fact we have to recognize. And if once they switch to capitalism, uh, they will probably do well what China did. But one thing I would like to make absolutely clear. First, unlike China, which, contrary to what many Westerners believe, has become a far more liberal place than it has ever been in probably its entire history and definitely under Mao, North Korea is not going to become more liberal. For Kim Jong-un and his people, the major conditions of staying in power is willingness and ability to use force and to brutally exterminate any challenges to the official ideology, official politics. They have to remain very, very repressive because North Korea exists facing the South, which is so damn successful. Second, don't expect them to surrender nukes. Nukes are there forever. North Korea will remain nuclear as long as the Kim family, on their immediate successes, stay in power in Pyongyang. They saw what happened to the world's only dictator who believed the Western promises and agreed to surrender nuclear weapons in exchange for the economic advantages. And they don't want the same thing which happened to poor Colonel Gaddafi to happen to them as well. Right. He was cheated. And they... They always knew he was going to be cheated, so they would never consider it. They will remain nuclear for this, uh, just to make sure that nobody will help a rebellion. So they will be free to machine gun uh, the demonstrators. There's no talk about, you know, flight-free zones and everything. And they also want to make sure that Americans or whoever will not invade, like it happened in Afghanistan and Iraq. They will remain nuclear. And of course, they will need it as a ma- their major tool of the blackmail diplomacy they are so good at. So they will remain repressive, ma- remain nuclear, and they will still remain be quite unstable place. Because all this might end up, in spite of all their efforts, it's not necessarily going to help them to get through. Uh, so things might end up badly. But if they do nothing things will end up badly for them anyway. So they have a chance. They are making a smart decision from their point of view. And if they succeed, in spite of everything I have said, um, I think it will be good for everybody. So if he wants to become a North Korean Park jong hee a North Korean Dan Xiaoping, a North Korean Lee Kuan Yew, a leader of a developmental dictatorship, wonderful. I wish him good luck. So to conclude, Professor Lankov, how should South Korea react to what is going on in North Korea? Should it just wait and uh, see what happens? Um, should it try to actively engage and support en- these reforms? Yes, yes. engage and support. Uh, because no, uh, North Korea will remain, as I have said, nuclear, repressive. And in order to keep domestic cohesion, they will have to occasionally stage provocations against the South. Because to keep people docile and obedient, Apart from propaganda, apart from fear, you also need a foreign enemy. It helps a lot. Uh, So I would expect that they will be not a nice neighbor, but they will be significantly less dangerous neighbor than they are now. So I believe engagement, engagement and more engagement. And And if they yes. Well, well, provocations should be reacted. Well, it's a a bad idea to be too Christian in the international relations. Turning another cheek doesn't help. But uh, within limits, within limits. So the idea is to support the uh, uh, pro-reform factions, reformist tendencies in North Korea to help them to become a reasonably successful developmental dictatorship. And even the process, North Korea collapses wonderful. The existence of connections, exchanges, will help South Korea to become a player, to have an impact on the post-collapse future of the North. And if they are just sitting on the fence like they are tend to do now over last maybe last 10 years, well, if collapse comes, it will they will have even less tools to mitigate the disaster because collapse and the German style unification is going to be economically almost disastrous. Mm. In the long run, it's good. 
in the long run, it's good. But the immediate impact, well. Having said that, I think that, yes, engagement, engagement, and more engagement, but also a lot of, well, what used to be called during the Cold War, propaganda warfare. Now it has a nice euphemism, strategic, how it's called, strategic information policy, something like that. So uh, engaging North Koreans, providing them with the information, uh, North Korean government doesn't want them to know, training them about the ways of the modern world, uh, giving them a realistic picture, it has to be realistic, don't tell them sweet stories about greatness of capitalism. Capitalism is probably the lesser evil in the modern world, but one should have no illusions about this system, which is not good. All others are worse, all others we have tried, but still. So North Koreans have to be prepared. Yes, it's something I would say. Yeah. Is trust politics the way the, yes. the right tool to engage? Yeah. But not talking about trust politics as North <laughs> South Koreans are doing now, but really doing it. Professor Lankov, thank you so much for being our guest today. Yeah, thank you. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.